Good morning, everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about something which is one of the, probably the only reason for Cranley having a claim to fame. And that's our village hospital. I'll start off by just looking at the origins of Cranley because this is, the hospital is actually situated in a listed building of the 15th century. Now Cranley, although we think of it now as the high street, it originated as two commons, the western common part of the uh, Bramley, late, late Saxon multiple estate, and the eastern was um, an outlier for Shear Manor. And if you look just at that eastern section, you can see the remainders of the common at the road junction. To the north, you've got St Nicholas Church and a moated site. And to the south there, you can see the hospital marked on this Ordnance Survey 19th century map. And to its east, the brewery and a small building within the brewery, which we'll also have a quick look at. The earliest evidence we have for Cranley, the Cranley Church, the um, structure around about 1280, it's mentioned in 1290, but excavation of the moated site says there was occupation there earlier, late 11th or 12th century. And the church is actually probably built on an encroachment on the common as a lay foundation. What's known as the rectory site, now Moat Lodge. We had minor excavation there in 85 when it was being redeveloped. That's where we picked up our early pottery um, and from a pre-moat settlement. In other words, there was a settlement there. And when the moat was constructed, the upthrow was thrown on top. The latest pottery from that island was from the moated site from after the construction of the moat. And that went through to about 1400. And this is probably the cap up for the rectory manor. Unfortunately, when Henry Woodyear came to build a rectory in 1863, the island was scalped. So we've lost a lot of evidence of what happened after um, about 1400. The next rectory or a rectory that we know about was drawn by Hassel, this is 1822, south of the present moated site, but north of the road. And it's actually on the site of the present rectory. And just looking at that building, that's clearly not a direct replacement for the settlement in the moat, deserted maybe about 1400. Now across the road, we have that little building in the brewery that I pointed out, known as Brewery Cottage in 1915. Disappeared behind Bruford's Brewery. And then we very nearly lost it in the 1980s when that building, plus very nice stucco listed building you can see in the background, and another building were all up for demolition. Unfortunately, we can't dendrochronologically date that building. Um, it's listed as 16th century. It's thought probably to be rather earlier than that. It's probably early to mid 15th. And there it is looking very sad next door to the pub. And there it is now. We did manage to save it. And if you buy petrol in Cranley, that's where you pay your money. Next door but one to that, just the other side of the pub, John Hassel also drew this in 1822, calling it the Old Vicarage. Uh, that's actually incorrect because Cranley is rectorial, so it should be the Old Rectory. Building that was listed as early 16th century, Dendra dated to 1446, and it probably was the rectory from its construction. It probably directly replaces the rectory within the moated site across the road. 
and into um, the probably the um, late 18th century. What happens to it exactly after that, we don't know. It remained in the ownership of the church and may simply have been a domestic property. And that, uh, there it is. All right, so what was happening in Cranley in the 19th century? Well, it was being dragged into the then modern period Big, big uh, improvements in, tr in transport, in routes, education there. We've got the school coming in. Um, matter of opinion whether the church was improved or not. It got a lot of things ripped out and uh, modernized to that period. Most importantly, we got the railway line, Horsham and Guildford Direct then through to Brighton, public water supply, new rectory, and uh, the Cranley School, the present public school, and also um, an elementary school, gas works, very large areas of new housing, and it actually took at least 11 brickworks to provide the bricks for all this. So huge, huge changes taking place particularly in the 1850s and 60s. And all this was driven by three individuals. And I think they were three people you really would not want to cross. Archdeacon Sapt, he was Archdeacon for nearly 60 years. Stephen Rowland, who was the great builder and this man, Albert Knapper, Dr. Albert Knapper, seen there as the founder of village hospitals. And behind him, you can see the sketch of that building we've been talking about, and that became the village hospital. And this is from his um, report from of the medical officer for 1863. At this stage, the village hospital had been in use for four years and opened in 1859. And he is reflecting on why cottage hospitals, village hospitals were useful and that the whole idea ought to be um, much more widely taken up. And he said, really, it, it has two things. It certainly benefits particularly the poor in the locality. But he's also pointing out that it benefits the medical profession because it provided a hub whereby doctors from the major hospitals, in this case, uh, Guildford, could come out and both um, help and possibly also to an extent educate the local rural doctors, particularly if they're being faced with a more severe situation than they're, than they're usually used to. And he's pointing out that without some sort of local provision, people either have to travel to the local hospital, and in the case of a serious illness, this would entail for us something like a 10 mile um journey by horse and cart so it's much better to have something local with the equipment to deal with the sort of accidents and illnesses that might happen and he said it's really quite easy to set something like this up all you need is a well ventilated cottage you need a kitchen and a room adjoining you need a wash house um, you need four airy bedrooms, set them up and allow one bed per thousand of the population. And to set something like that up, he reckons it would cost about eight pounds, 10 shillings per bed, about 500 pounds in modern terms. 
How is it going to be paid for? How is it going to be managed? Well, he is suggesting that people who are interested in perhaps uh, taking advantage of the services offered might well set up annual subscriptions. And in fact, what very often happened was that people, um, the wealthier people who were moving into these rural villages, into Cranley, would pay a subscription something like um, three to five shillings a year. But he also encouraged relatively poor people to ha perhaps put a penny or a halfpenny in when they could afford it. Uh, it's management of few trustees and a small committee acting on a perfectly independent basis. He is very keen that although quite a lot of the money is coming from the richer people within the village, the hospital must be under medical supervision. And I do like the idea of a small committee. Patients can be recommended by subscribers. They may not be nominated. So admission rests totally with the medical officer and the manager. And looking at the finances of 1860, the receipts considerably outweigh the outgoings. So he is getting enough money in for the need of the patients. And he said the great majority, of course, from the wealthy, but the principle of self-aid is established by a system of weekly payments. And he's quite scathing when comparing the poor agricultural labourers who are contributing to the hospital and compares it with the London hospitals, with the plethoric butlers and dainty ladies' maids, who could very easily do without, um, very easily uh, um, afford everything inside or outside of the hospital. So he's, he's a real believer in helping the poor in a local rural area. And that's an article for the BMJ, no less. Okay, the rules. It's designed for the accommodation of the poor when suffering from disease or accidents. They want two members of staff, a nurse and somebody else to do basically the housework and the washing. If the nurse is not needed in the hospital, she may look after people in their own homes during confinements. And payments will be uh, patients are received on the basis of the payment of a weekly sum, which they may have set up already, or depending on their circumstances, it may be paid by the employer uh, after discussion with the hospital manager. And what we don't find as you go through the years are that people are being turned away because they can't afford it. Quite a few seem to be brought in who are um, really without money and they are still treated. 1861, the second annual report, we start getting to, to see the sort of people who are being uh, admitted and the sort of problems that they're facing. And we've got there an elderly labourer from Allfold. He's had to have uh, his arm amputated because he has some sort of cancer affecting his hand. And at the other end of the age scale, a five-year-old from Ewhurst, admitted with symptoms of stones in the bladder, and had it for two years. Um, and the recognition there that Although he, he is improved, he may have to be readmitted. GM brought him from Putnam. Uh, poor man, he'd gone up to London to have an operation for cataract. Uh, not sure how catching a cold has affected this, but they're rather proud of the fact that he leaves the in hospital improved of health. But unfortunately, he has gone blind as a result of it 
cataract operation going wrong. Other labourer from all folds there, committed with extreme debility from attack of rheumatic fever, requiring a generous diet and good nursing. And when we get um, details of the diet, it really is a good diet. It's high in meat, high in fresh vegetables, very little mention of fruit, but good and regular portions of port wine. I don't know if the six-year-old gets port wine. And the poor lad there, he's, he's been admitted with a skull on his back, but unfortunately he gets whooping cough. And of course, at this stage, whooping cough is frequently fatal. Um, very sad story of J.S., the son of a bargeman from Whisper Green, and this is the Way and Aran Junction Canal, admitted with a hectic fever. He'd been deserted by his family and just left on the wharf. He was taken into the hospital, appeared to be getting better, but after a while it became clear that there was something major wrong. And although he was, the, the leg was amputated, it was found to be cancerous. Now he unusually was kept in the hospital, but the cancer, which is presumably a sarcoma or an osteosarcoma of some sort, had spread and he died a few weeks later. And of course we get injuries from assorted agricultural machinery. A six-year-old and his thumb crushed in the top of a threshing machine. A 12-year-old with an injury caused by a turn cutting machine. A bricklayer, he's got a bad knee. Um, they venture, they... Um... Oh, get off. Sorry? Okay, the bricklayer from Cranley, he uh, is given port wine freely. Not sure if that is an anaesthetic or not. It should be chloroform. But his leg incised to remove the inflammation in the cellular tissue and he's left hospital well. And we've got Mrs. S.W. with a large abdominal tumour, the seat of disease thought to be the uterus, and discharged as incurable. And that was one of the basic rules of the hospital. They did not look after terminal cases. If the patient could be, uh, had a reasonable chance of being cured, they would be admitted. But if the disease was incurable, they were sent home in which case the nurse could then go out and help. And of course, we've got the uh, railway being built at this period. And we've got here an Irish labourer in search of work, admitted with two severe wounds to the scalp. He's been in a fight. I don't know, then as a ruffian armed with an iron implement. And it looks as though his wife tried to help and she was also quite severely illness, quite severely wounded, fracture of the frontal bone, but both discharged convalescent. And more terrible injuries from the railway. We've got the navvies there, one having a laden truck run over him and he couldn't be saved. Another one injured with a, um, a heavy fall of earth. He was discharged well. And it's not clear whether it's the same uh, fall of earth, but there's obviously another one here who's been crushed and presumably with uh, bleeding into the lungs from a laceration and he didn't survive. And if we look for 32 admissions in 1863, seven of them are navvies working on the construction of the railway. There were two other railway workers, and one's a bargeman on the Way and Aran Canal 
So it's those those major infrastructure works are behind a number of the, the worst accidents. And Dr. Napper makes his a comment in his report that it would have been very difficult to treat these in the sort of huts in which the navvies lived, that they were too badly injured really to be taken into Guildford by cart and they make the, the village hospital instrumental if they can't save the person's life, then they can at least reduce the suffering. Of the first 100 import, inpatients, 67 are parish paupers, 16 are in humble circumstances. And this is a period where, although Cranley is being changed, and we have got a lot of um, wealth coming in and a lot of very um, big houses being built, there is still a majority of the population in um, pretty dire circumstances as agriculture had collapsed and agricultural labourers were really um, barely above poverty level. So it, it's that background of consistent poverty which is sending a lot of people into the, the village hospital. Now, Cranley's very proud of the fact that uh, this is the first village hospital or the first cottage, ho cottage hospital. Um, and there's a, a, a rather uh, interesting comment here by Henry Burdett in 1896 about the credit being claimed by another hospital in Middlesbrough. But it does point up the difference between the main hospitals and the cottage hospitals. And the reason Burdett says that this does seem that the, the Middlesbrough hospital is not in the same sort of bracket as the Cranley Cottage Hospital, it's in an <coughs> urban population. It has 60 beds. And it is um, not fulfilling the idea of bringing medicine out to rural populations. OK, so we go on to 1901. And Cranley's population has something like doubled in about 40 years. And he's saying that there's been an increase in population. And of course, med medicine has improved. So really, the old hospital is not meeting the, the needs of the time. We need additional buildings with, with modern appliances. And so there are plans put forward to build two new wards. Um, and Mr. Pandeli Raleigh of Alderbrook, now, he's an interesting man. He's he's uh, a descendant of a family of Greeks who come over as very, very big traders. He becomes Justice of the Peace for Surrey, among other things. And he gives a thousand pounds. Now, that's 78,000 pounds in modern money. And one of those wards is to be named in honour of his late sister. In 1903, the extension had been built. Subscriptions had raised 1,983 pounds, 12 shillings. And again, we've got more coming in with the subscriptions than the extension eventually cost. It doubled the bed number, added a woman's ward and extended and the operating theater. And after Albert Napper, his one of his sons, Arthur Napper, continued in the medical profession, virtually every picture I can find of Arthur Napper has him on horseback. But he's a he's one of comes a doctor again, works in Cranley during the First World War, and he is both the doctor for the village hospital and for the Red Cross Hospital. Of course, Cranley with a um 
railway line down to the coast was one of the places to whom patients, soldiers brought back from the front in France could be taken up to a, a hospital somewhere in the southeast. And Cranley gets a number of these. And there they are. Those are the World War I uh, soldiers outside, in this case, um, Oaklands, the Red Cross Hospital for the services. After the First World War, the Village Hospital Committee decide that really they have got to again try to increase the size of the hospital. Population is still going up at a rate and it's, the hospital simply isn't big enough. So they decide to extend the hospital. Uh, the rector sold the freehold of the land, which was part of the glebe, to the trustees of the hospital. The brewery next door gave part of their garden. They had a tied house, the Three Horseshoes, which is still there. And they gave part of the garden of the Three Horseshoes to the hospital. And the Mrs. Nauman purchased part of the garden of uh, the stucco building broad out next door and also gave that to the trustees. And that provided the land for a major extension. One thing there, you start thinking about the number of the, the years it takes now to get any piece of infrastructure or any building through, and we're not going to mention HHS2 here. 1921, they're putting the land together. 1922, the extension opens in February. And they've got another two wards, a room for the sister, a bathroom for the staff, uh, extension of the operating theatre again, so that it's got a separate sterilising room, a boardroom, which if there is an epidemic, and they've, they've just gone through the great flu epidemic, they can turn that into an extra ward, and they install central heating. And there it is, you've got the old cottage, the 1446 cottage on the left there, and then the extension. And the extension also goes rather further off to the, to the right. So the extension over doubles the size of the original hospital. And we get the men's ward. This is the gas heating. So the gas lighting, the operating theatre, one of the old wards, you see the timber framing there from the old cottage. kitchen, well what about Cranley Village Hospital today? Well we have a very major problem at the moment. The beds were taken up until the end of the 20th century. The beds were still in use and they were mainly used for convalescence. So local people who didn't need the um, district general in Guildford could come back to Cranley and have a week or a couple of weeks convalescing before going home. But that's very much against modern NHS thinking. And so since the beds that the hospital couldn't really be um, brought up to a sort of standard for a modern hospital and they didn't believe in convalescence we lost the beds it provides at the moment a range of outpatient services very wide 
uh, range. It's not it's radiology, physiotherapy, diagnostic images and all sorts of things. But we have a major problem. The old building is in poor condition and it's deteriorating. There's been virtually no maintenance done for about the last 30 years. And it's only being used for storage. The NHS at the present time simply do not have the money to restore it, although it's a listed building. And so we've got local efforts going on to try to find an alternative use. Uh, we don't, the general thinking is that the NHS aren't using it particularly effectively and probably don't really want to have it at all. And so it needs an alternative use and trying to raise funding, trying to get some grants, getting feasibility studies done to see what can be done to try and save the hospital, save the old part of the building. Um, when I first came to Cranley, they were then trying to keep the hospital open and were successful. The NHS really put up a challenge. They said that they would improve the hospital and keep it going if we could raise £25,000. And we think this was 1973. That was a lot of money and you couldn't move in Cranley without somebody asking you to do something for the hospital. And we raised that £25,000 in less than eight weeks. I don't think we thought then we'd be in the same position again, but we are. And we're trying to, I say, find some way of keeping that first of the cottage hospitals, preferably in use for medical purposes. But if not, then at least giving it a purpose and therefore a future. Thank you.